are listening to the one of us.net podcast network. Welcome to the Screamcast, episode 104. I am Sean DeRager, and as always with me is Brad Henderson. 104? Yeah, man. Last week was 103. Shit. It's now 104. Damn, bro. Excuse me one second while I let my dog in who's scratching at the door. Hold on. Man, right off the bat. All right, and we're leaving all that in. (laughs) Welcome to the podcast, everybody. Today, uh, pretty excited about today. We're going to be talking um, the American Horror Project, the uh, box set released by Arrow Video. Uh, We're going to be talking about that with Stephen Thrower, who is the co-curator of that set. He's also the author of Nightmare USA. Um, So you should check that book out if you haven't yet. But first, before we get into all that, let's jump into what's on our doorstep. Holy cow, I almost forgot. We'll get the door. Pizza. Oh, snap. Mm-hmm. What's up, man? Not much. What arrived on your doorstep? Um, I don't even know. <laughs> Uh, I've watched a, I've watched a lot. Some stuff I can talk about. Some stuff I can't. Of course. Um, let's see here. Man, I really want to talk about certain things. Um, all right, <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just start with stuff that I can talk about. Okay. Um, I watched uh, the Criterion release of Easy Rider, which I, I saw when I was younger. Um, I would say early teens, maybe about 14, 15 years old, I was going to Blockbuster and like Retin Academy Award winning movies because I wanted to be that film person. And then <laughs> right. I was like, I was like, man, I can't stay away from the horror section. Like I kept going back. But anyway, so I rented things off and on. Certain things stuck with me hard, um, you know, like Harold and Maud and, and things like that. Um, you know, uh, Year of the Dragon. I know that's not really Academy Award winner, but Year of the Dragon really got me. Um, you know, stuff like Stand by Me. Mm-hmm. I, I was discovering these movies on on by myself because I mean, when I was in early teens, I would say thirteen, fourteen years old, um, I didn't really have resources. I mean, the internet was there, but not like it is today, where you know you can just you, you know a plethora of information on the internet about every movie you want that didn't exist. You know, I had, like I mentioned all the time on the show, I had an all movie guide, um, that would help me out, tell me movies and everything like that. Uh, so I eventually rented easy rider and, um, you know, I thought it was okay. And I was quick, kind of quickly dismissed it for the most part. Um, cause I was kind of getting in, I was expecting, you know, cause I was really into like vanishing point. Um, you know, the original gone in 60 seconds, the Junk Man, uh, Dirty Mary, Crazy Larry, um, uh, White Lightning, s- stuff like that. I was really, really into, and I thought Easy Rider was going to be something like that, um, and it wasn't. And I was a, I was kind of, I didn't think it was a bad movie. I just really didn't talk about it or really think about it too much. Um, so the Criterion release of that, so I figured I'd pick it up because I really liked the American Dreamer, you know, that we spoke yeah. about from Vinegar Syndrome. I thought it was one of the best documentaries. Uh, I guess it's a die. It's almost like a home movie. Um, you know, one of the best things that I saw last year is still remains one of my favorites. I think about it all the time. So I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to watch Easy Rider again, um, you know, because Criterion released it. So it's kind of glorious transfer all that. You know, they always do a bang up job. Um, and with that mindset, I, I watched it thinking about American Dreamer as well. So it kind of, 
I think a cool triple feature would be to watch Easy Rider, American Dreamer, and then watch the last movie, which is, you know, uh, American Dreamer's the in-betweener, you know, after Easy Rider, before last movie, during last movie of, you know, Dennis Hopper and his, you know, psychological breakdown <laughs> of, of, of himself trying to make a movie as good as Easy Rider, as, as well known as Easy Rider is and how good it was at the time. To me, I enjoyed Easy Rider because it feels – I enjoy it in the aspect of Dennis Hopper and knowing the American Dreamer and, and knowing Last Movie Now where I am in life watching films and enjoying it on another level of being almost experimental. I honestly think if Easy Rider came out today, it would not be looked at twice um, because it very much is an experimental film yeah. of drugs. And dude, they're all fucking on drugs during this movie. It's way oh, too totally. obvious. <laughs> you know, it, the, the, I don't even really think there's a script to, to the film. It's just cruising along, talking about dope and money. Yep. Um, so, but I really enjoyed it because I'm thinking of the American dreamer. I, I don't know. I, I think, Little old me, when I saw it, I was expecting something else. I didn't get it. But knowing what I know now and kind of, you know, being fascinated with De- Dennis Hopper at this point, especially during that that time frame of him making those movies, um, I really, really dug Easy Rider. But I, I honestly, I think before you watch Easy Rider, if you've never seen it, you need to watch Vinegar Syndrome's release of American Dreamer. And that's just not a plug for them because, I mean, I've talked about American Dreamer a few times. Um, but I think watching all three, like a triple feature of all those, I think that's almost an experience rather than just watching some movies or cinema. I think that's, um, a really detailed and in-depth look of Dennis Hopper and his filmmaking career. So highly suggest you pick it up. Um, you know, just, it, it looks great and it's got a great soundtrack. Peter Fonda is, steals the movie basically. I don't even know, like, Dennis Hopper's not even recognized to me in that movie. It's all about Peter Fonda, and then of course when they meet up with uh, with Jack Nicholson. Um, but yeah, I definitely that to me that's it, it was it's awesome. Like I gave it f- five out of five, but on a level of almost an ex- like an experience of watching a movie, not the movie itself. That makes sense. That makes sense. I think so. Hopefully it makes sense. Well, Easy um, Rider is just a, such a strange film. It's not it, really – It's very no, weird. Like, really not you, a huge plot. It's just you know, you're hanging out with these guys on the bike as these motor, on their motorcycles going across country or wherever uh, just doing drugs and – Yeah, but it, I agree with you. Like the last, um, the last few minutes of that movie when they're in like – having like the graveyard psychedelic flashbacks and <laughs> shit like that. The movie's really fucking bizarre. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of cool to, uh, you know, think about how well that movie was received, but it was, I think everybody was on drugs. They watched right. it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, definitely right up my alley. Um, and it's weird coming from me because I don't know if we ever talked about this on the show, but I've only smoked pot once in my life mm-hmm. and I've never done any other drug. So I find it fascinating when I see it like that. Yeah. I've only tried know. it like three times, and each yeah. those three times I basically just laughed a little bit and then fell asleep. <laughs> People are probably thinking, what, Brad? You sound like a fucking crazy maniac. Uh, you don't do drugs? No, I don't. Um, so next up, um, I, I got to – I love these. I love this series so much. It was the Maze Runner. I talked about it a little bit last night on Twitter. I finally got around to watching Maze Runner, The Scorch Trials. Um, when I very first saw Maze Runner earlier last year, I fucking loved it. It felt like I was watching a movie from my childhood that mm-hmm. I missed. Um, very kind of straight out of the 80s. Uh, the action sequences were very much like that. It just felt like I was watching I, – I, I say No Escape meets Lord of the Flies. That's <laughs> what these movies feels like to me. Um, but I loved Maze Runner. I finally got around to watching Scorch Trials. I missed it at the theater. I picked it up when it came out on Blu-ray, and I just haven't really gotten around to it, and Willow wanted to watch it. Um, fucking fantastic. Still the same. It keeps it, – it went up a notch with the action. It's a fucking zombie movie. Like, it's huh. fucking zombies uh, throughout the movie. Like, there's a uh, – it's called – they're infected with this thing called The Flare. Um, but they're fucking zombies. Like they're on the run from these creatures for a good portion of the movie meeting up. I mean, it's like, 
it's like no escape meets like road warrior meets you know lord of the flies meets you know kind of a john carpenter ish like escape from new york la more or less la than anything because it kind of has that maze runner is like the 80s and scores trial is more like the 90s like in cinema for <laughs> for us and and it's weird because these young adult uh, novels are being in the, made in the movies, like you know, all the time. Yeah, it's so hard to I, know which ones are good now. I mean, you well, know, most of them are garbage, and yeah. I'm sorry if anybody likes it. Well, but I'm not I a fan really, of Hunger Games at all. I yeah, I really don't care for those movies, um, just because it, they feel bland. Um, there's not really, it doesn't feel like there's characters established or. Um, you know, there's no character dynamics. It feels in in those films, um, and it's not, you know, kind of putting down the film. I think it's more or less to relate to the audience, um, not because the audience is stupid, but it's written from a young adult uh, yeah. perspective I mean, in a way. Gotta, I mean, they're four the source, kids. Yeah, you gotta keep right. You gotta material. stay stay true to the source material. Um, apparently the scores trials, I haven't read the books, but apparently from people I spoke to about it from last night, it doesn't follow the book all that much. Um, it kind of does its own thing, but that's high, neither here or there. It's very, I mean, this film seems like it shouldn't be something that I would like. It doesn't seem like it's geared towards me at all, but I think Wes Ball, the director of these films, really has kind of affinity for um, action cinema from the 80s and 90s because that's what – that's the vibe I get. All these pr- the fucking practical effects uh, in the film other than for maybe a couple sequences. But, um, you know, the Grievers look great and um, in the first film. The zombies look great. There's a there's some Vine zombies that remind me of I Am Legend a little bit that come <laughs> out. But it's easily dismissed because it's, it happens so quickly. But um, great characters, the camaraderie with the cast, the young kids is great. Uh, Barry Pepper's in it, which is super weird because oh. I haven't seen Barry yeah, Pepper since like been? Battlefield Earth days. <laughs> um, but it's all around. It, 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 the, both of these films are great, and I can't wait until that third one comes out. Huh. And West Ball is directing it. I can't recommend these movies enough because – as far as action cinema goes, this is something that feels special because yeah. it has that nostalgia for 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 older people. Um, I say that and I'm fucking thirty, but I think for people that grew up watching action movie the '90s and loves those types of films, uh, loves films from the '80s, I think this is truly something special for us because he's making these films and he's not doing turning to the camera and be like, Hey, I really like these old movies. Wink, wink. Look at me. Look at me. It's nothing like that. These movies stand on their own. And I've, uh, interacted with people when I liked maze runner and I like this, I had people say, I didn't get that vibe at all. And I've had other people say, yes, it truly is like kind of this nineties, eighties, John Carpenter, no escape Lord of the Fr- flies feel. So I, I'm really digging those movies, and I, I, I hope that, um, you know, I, they're doing well because obviously the kids and teenagers like them. But I really hope adults give it a chance because I think these are really great movies. I know they are, and I don't think anything. I, I know they're really great movies and something for everybody to enjoy. Well, I, I really fan- like the first one. I, I haven't watched uh, Scorch Trials yet. I think Scorch Trials is better than Maze Runner. Huh. Um, and I really, really fucking love Maze Runner. Um, so next up we have um, Regression, which is the new um, – I, I mean, I guess it came out last year, but uh, I think it finally hit Blu-ray yeah. with Ethan Hawke and um, Emma Watson. Uh, making it spoiler-free. <laughs> um, it is about a man that comes into – a police station who is wanted because of the abuse, a sexual abuse of his teenage daughter, but can't remember anything. So they bring in a psychiatrist to do kind of hypnosis, um, to hypnotize him, to put him back into 
that period of that event. Uh, Ethan Hawke is one of the main detectives on the case, and they put him in that situation of revisiting that night, and it kind of unfolds from there. Um, I will say it's up my alley in the sense of the content, which has to deal with cults and Satan. So that should be enough to turn you on to where this film goes. However, I was not a fan of the movie because of what it developed into. Hmm. Um, so watch it for yourselves, and uh, anybody that likes it, let me know uh, how you felt about the ending, because I was not uh, on board. Um, I thought the film was pretty scary, uh, kind of terrifying with, with the cult aspect. I'm, I'm The thing is with me, I'm super biased. As soon as you say there's a cult or I see an upside-down cross, I'm automatically going to give the movie a 10. <laughs> like it starts off at 10, like regression, like the title pops up and then the eye in regression slowly turns into an upside down cross. And I just pause it and I start applauding <laughs> in, in my living room. I'm like, all right, we're starting off at a 10. Let's just go up. Um, and it kept it going up. And then it's one of those things that can make or break a movie and it broke it for me. Yeah. And it's not that it didn't make sense. It's just something I didn't want to see, but I think it's a cool plot device I just didn't like it for this movie. And I know that the movie was made because of that plot device. But, um, you know, the only other thing I could say is that, nope, I'm not going to say it. So <clears throat> let I'm me know what you think. I've, I've seen, I've, I saw a few people pick this up on Tuesday. Yeah, apparently it's so. Anchor Bay, so it's probably like 10 bucks. It's, I think it was like 14.99 or 12.99 or something yeah, like it's that. It's 10 bucks on Voodoo, so oh. um, I rented it for like 3.99. Um, yeah, I, I like writing it. Fucking Ethan Hawke is like what a horror actor veteran now. I know, man. I mean, he—I don't think he gets enough credit. I mean, uh. he is in Sinister, Daybreakers. He was in this. He was in um, what was the? Uh, I mean, he's in The Purge, which is very, you know, horror, horish. <laughs> It's funny saying that. Whenever I try to um, use like my voice thing on my phone to say horror, it spells that horror. So Siri thinks I'm ordering horrors. Ooh, I what? I was, sorry, I might put you in jail. <laughs> um, but yeah, Ethan Hawke, yeah, I think he, you know, he's finally kind of coming around in the sense of, I feel like he's doing what he wants, which yeah, I think he's getting he, good work. Like he's doing, he's not like Nicholas caging it up. You know what I mean? Or he's yeah. just taking whatever he's, he's taking interesting projects for sure. Yeah, I, I just, um, you know, I, I, I like him. I mean, everything from, I mean, he's did like The Purge, and then he did Boyhood, and then he did like you know some kind of low budget films, and well, the, then before the Before Sunset trilogy thing, he wrapped that up. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, he does a lot of independent cinema, which yeah. I dig. He's in um, Ty West uh, in the Valley of Violence, mm. aka John Wick in the West. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, literally is John Wick. Fucking, they kill his dog and he goes on a killing rampage. Like, (laughs) uh, watching it, I'm like, I know that Ty West, like, had that idea, but you think that you'd watch a movie, I mean, fucking, what, Luke Besson wrote Lockout, and it's basically a mirrored image of fucking Escape from New York. Like, Yeah, but it's awesome. Yeah, awesome enough that he got sued by John Carpenter because of it. That's bullshit. And, and won. That's Dude, crazy. it's a fucking ripoff. Like, it totally is almost, like... But uh, how many movies are there that are, om- like, direct homages to older movies? You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, but... An, like, like, look at Roger Corman. Like, Roger Corman should have been sued, like, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> no, it, because Roger Corman ripped himself off <laughs> more than anything, but... For, in, in the sense of, you know, kind of using exact plot devices and almost beat by beat. Of, I mean, in the Valley of Violence, it doesn't do that because obviously it's the West. But, I mean, using that plot device that's so simple. Like, when you think about John Wick, you're like, hey, what's John Wick about? Um, this guy's an assassin. They kill his dog. 
and he goes on a killing rampage. I would have fucking laughed. But there's more to the dog in John Wick. Right, but that's the plot. There's a reason why he hel- he holds that dog. No, I understand, but that's the plot. Right. The plot is they kill a guy's dog, <laughs> and he goes on a killing rampage. Yeah. And and when he said, like, the thing is, is, Keanu Reeves is, like, your brother. When you watch his movies, you're just like, you think, you hear Keanu Reeves, and you're like, I fucking like that guy. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no one, if anybody says anything bad about Keanu Reeves, I just fucking slap him in the face. <laughs> I'm like, you don't understand, like, how cool this fucking guy is. Like, you know, I, I've been there when he's at these festivals. He's just fucking talks to people. Like, he, he loves movies. He just wants to fucking make cool movies. He just wants to hang out. You know, his movies feel like you're hanging out with him. Yeah. Um. So it works because if, if you put anybody else in that movie, I don't think it would have worked. Oh no! I, I think that movie was made for that Keanu Reeves character, like the badass, you know, Point Break, fucking Bill and Ted. You know, he he's just he's just a fun loving guy. But anyways, we got off really subject of evil. <laughs> but um, yeah, watch Regression. Let me know uh, what you think if you kind of feel the same way. Um, uh, that's pretty much all I can talk about. All right. Um, hopefully, I can talk about stuff later on when movies get distribution. Sounds good, man. Because you really can't. Like the thing is, you're not. It's kind of the thing is, is that you know you see these movies that you don't like, and this is my kind of beef with festivals. Is that you know I watch a movie to help out with a festival or something. Hey, watch this, Brad doesn't have distribution. I'm probably only a handful of people have seen it. I have no right to say that movie is bad or not good or it didn't pique my interest. Right. So for the most part, I just keep my mouth shut because I never want to, you know, throw a monkey wrench in. Because the thing is, companies do listen. They use Twitter. They click on, you know, hashtags. That helps films get distribution. So if you're at a festival and you are just like tweeting and shitting on a movie – Stop. Yeah, you gotta like, get, these movies have to at least don't be do given it. a chance to be yeah, in the world. Yeah, someone's gonna like it. You know, someone's gonna like it. You know, d- don't. You know, don't almost like fucking disable a movie because you know from going anywhere because I've seen it happen. I mean, there's movies that I saw years ago that have never ever made distribution. Yeah. You know, and um, it, it's kind of uh, you know, it's kind of sad. I, I think well, on the one show with uh. With Pete uh, Toombs, I mentioned a movie, The Last Screening. You can't fucking find that anywhere. There's a French DVD that costs like 50 bucks <laughs> in order to get. Movie, unless you download it illegally, but like that film will never, like, unless I told Pete to look into it. Hopefully they release it. Um, but, you know, you have a movie that's never going to be seen pretty much by American audiences. Yeah. It didn't do very well at festivals. And it's, a great movie, but no one's going to fucking see it. The same thing happened with, uh, I think the same show we talked about masks, a German giallo. You'll never see that movie. It came out like 2011, huh. 2016. We masks are not released in the U S yeah. And there's thousands of movies like that. There's even movies that have never been released anywhere. Most of them are found footage. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I've seen some well, found mo- footage okay, movies, but you know the thing is, is that <clears throat> what the problem? Another problem is with some of these uh, companies, or not companies, but some of these filmmakers, is that they make a movie and they want you know Magnet to pick it up or some bigger company to put it in stores, and frankly, the movie isn't good enough, so they pass on all the small guys because they offer such a low amount. But then that company passes, and then you're out of luck because no one wants it. That's exactly what happens to these guys. So that's the reason why you see so many found footage movies is because, honestly, it didn't cost them that much. And they're going to sell to the first person that probably offers them anything. Yeah. Um, you know, and every once in a while you get a good one. Most of the time you get a shitty one. Most right. of the time. Right on. All right. I'm going to jump into my movies. She got shot. We get Steven Thrower on the show. 
Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is, I don't think I've talked about this yet. Uh, Mill Creek released it. My boyfriend's back. Have I talked about that yet? I talked uh, about my science project from Mill Creek. Yeah, we didn't talk about All my right. boyfriend's back. Uh, I was trying to get Bob Babylon. Bob Babylon. And this was my, I thought I'd seen it before, but I guess I hadn't. And uh, this is 1993 flick. feels very much like an 80s flick. Oh, it's, like, yeah. It's great. So it's, does Parents. Uh, yeah, parents, yeah, yeah. Parents is made in the 90s, I believe. Yep, totally. Um, it's great. It, it has that, that feel of an 80s movie. I think it takes place in the 80s. Um, but, uh, of course, the main character, played by, uh, was it Johnny? Played by Andrew Lowry. Who, what, what else has he, has he been in? He seems super familiar. He's really good in this. Um, Andrew, I can't, Andrew I can't. Andrew Lowry, I don't I know can't. what the hell he's been in. He, like, nothing much, I guess. I'm What's he look right like? Now. What's he look like? Um, I don't, I don't, I can't think what he Is looks that, like. that's, that's the, that's the guy that's in Buffy the Vampire Slayer that is Buffy's boyfriend's friend who, when she leans over the car, he goes, Hey man, can I borrow her? <laughs> and he's like, dude, hands off. Maybe, uh, that's, his, that's the kid, that's the, the guy kid? that's in my boyfriend's back. Yeah, he's in like, he's in, um, he's not in that much as far as like, Letterbox doesn't really show him in that yeah, much. He's Color in, of um, Night and Final Color, Charm. Oh, the, the Bruce, Bruce Willis movie? <laughs> yeah. Um, he plays Bruce Willis's. Dick. He's in School Ties. I, I, he's in School Ties. It's the movie I was thinking about. Really? But no, I think this was like his big, his big break. You know, I, he's, and it just it didn't it didn't hit. He's really funny. He plays a you know plays a this 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 kind of a loner type guy. Really likes this girl. He's liked her since you know since he was a kid. Played by Tracy Lynn, who's super cute. Uh, um, let's talk about Tracy Lynn, class of 1999. Mm-hmm, Hello. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Fucking Fright Night 2. Yeah. But, um, so he creates this elaborate plan with his friend who has like a, uh, a Shia LaBeouf vibe, Danny Zorn. I think it's the only movie he's ever been in. I don't know, but he looks like Shia LaBeouf, like a weird, like bizarro world Shia LaBeouf. Um, mm. they hatch this plan where his friend's going to act like he's robbing the convenience, the convenience store where she works. Of course, uh, Johnny's going to come in and save the day, ask her to prom, live happily ever after. Uh, unfortunately, a real robber comes in and, uh, Johnny gets shot and basically turns into a zombie. So, uh, it's very lighthearted. Uh, you know, he's turning into a zombie. And, um, but everyone seems to be kind of okay with it, which is kind of peculiar, uh, and, and funny. So it sets up a lot of things, a lot of humor, but it was a really good movie, man. Like I had a lot of fun. Oh watching yeah. It. It's, it's great. I think Bob Babylon has a really good grab on making fun kind of, um, almost like a dream state mm-hmm. of movies, I, especially like kind of with parents, my boyfriend's back. Uh, they both had kind of have that same, like, um, I can't think of the name, but just kind of like a, I can't think of the word I'm trying to say. Um, kind of a suburban, yeah. like, feel, you know? I, it, I guess it, yeah. suburbia. Yeah, yeah. He, he does, I mean, it's, it's, he, it's lighter for sure. Feel, it feels lighter, but it's, it's very fun. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and what I liked, like, he does a lot of, like, comic book transitions. So it starts off like with comic book pages and things like that and it's and transitions yeah. into scenes. Just really fun. Um good flick. It was fun to discover that. I I, I it's one of those I swear that I saw in the video store and never got around yeah. to watching. Dude, it's it, it's great. I mean, the cast in it too. I mean, Bob Babylon can get a good cast because he's, you know, been a writer in Hollywood for many years and an actor. But I mean fucking what is it, Matthew Fox is in that movie? Yeah. Yo, uh, oh, dude, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's yeah. in it. <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman, yeah. Matthew McConaughey is in that movie. Is um, McConaughey in that? Yeah, he's like one of the friends. Oh, it's he's like a super small part, right? Yeah, yeah, he just has a small part. Cloris Leachman, <laughs> who just like turned fucking 90. Um, yeah. And then Paul Dooley, who's yep. a, a familiar face, you know, kind of a – always plays a gangster, kind of a doofus. But yeah, and, and Tracy Lynn. Yeah. I mean, fucking – Class of 1999. Did we ever talk about Class of 1999 on the show? <laughs> I don't know. Have we? I don't know. <laughs> but she's she's in this. 
Um, anyways, it's Mill Creek, so it's uh, it's fairly cheap, bare bones release. I don't know if this is streaming anywhere or not, so it would be worth it to pick it up if you're a fan of these types of movies. I think it's um, pretty damn cheap. I'm trying to look here. Uh, 5.89. <laughs> no it's brainer. Creek. Yeah, it's Mill Creek. Buy that shit. It looks great too. Looks Which I awesome. just got. Um, there. My pro. One of my goals for 2016 was to watch Miami Vice. Well, Mill Creek's releasing, re-releasing down. Miami Vice on DVD. So I'll be watching those shortly. I can't wait. Hell yeah. Um. Anyway, this, I mean, I, I would, if you're a fan of these types of comedy, is, this is comedy done right. Um, it's, it's really great story. It's very story driven, very fun, very light, but, um, the, I, I just had a blast with it. And for 589, you can't go wrong. So buy that shit. Um, I agree. I moving agree, along so. to another flick, I finally got around to watching my FX2 Blu ray. Oh yeah. Put out by Kino Lorber's. They put out FX and FX2. And I watched this movie like crazy as a kid. I had the VHS and I think I wore the VHS out. I, I, it's crazy the, the, the kinds of movies you kind of, you know, gravitate towards as a kid. And Mm -hmm. this, I saw this before the first FX. And I always love the opening because it opens up with like this movie within a movie type thing where there's like this uh, transvestite robot killing machine (laughs) scene. Uh, and it's just fantastic, and uh, and the movie's great as well. So I think I, I like this one more than the first FX. I think they're both that. both pretty solid. They're both fantastic. So um, it looks great, sounds great, and um, so if you're probably a fan of that, fairly cheap too, huh? Fairly cheap too, probably. Yeah, I think I I think I was waiting for this to get on on sale. There's a Kino lower sale. That's like fourteen bucks or something. Yeah, I don't know. But um, but yeah, I'm a huge fan of that movie, and it was, it was really fun revisiting for sure. So another movie that was this in the 80s or 90s, 1991, uh, but feels very very late 80s. Yeah, um, yeah, I think the first one was in the 80s. Yeah. Second one was in the 90s. And dude, Brian Dennehy, I mean, that man is awesome. I love when he first shows up in the movie. He's like. Uh, you know, his his first line is like, you know, get off my roof and get in the fucking car. <laughs> Friend and he's a shit. Yeah, he's he's very intimidating too. Yeah, extremely intimidating. Um. All right, and finally, uh, of course, Deadpool came out this week, and I never made it to the theater to watch Deadpool, so I had my first time watch of Deadpool at my house on Blu-ray, and I had a blast. Yeah, it's fun, man. Super fun. I was expecting it to be a little bit cheesy, but for me, like all the humor just hit. I was cracking up. Um, my wife enjoyed it, which was which was fun. That's fun when we both can enjoy a movie. It's 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 one of those movies that I think, as as for a person that doesn't really care for the comic book world, I mean the movies are fun. Whatever, most of them, some of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but kind of getting burnt out on everything. I think that Deadpool is refreshing because yeah. it knows it's a comic book movie. And I think that's why it works. Totally. Yep. It's, so. it's almost in a sense, skewering the whole comic book movie sensibility. Yeah. Um, it's, I love it, the jabs that they take at Fox. It's it, it, Fox's big balls to, to release a movie like this and let the script writers ha- poke fun at. Yeah. Them and the I franchises. was, I was surprised even like of, you know, the characters breaking that wall yeah. and acknowledging that Wolverine exists and, um, you know, yeah. kind of fuck that movie and what happened. <laughs> um, you know, and it's cool that Ryan Reynolds stuck with that character too. Cause I mean, he was Deadpool in the Wolverine movie. Yeah. That almost, and, that movie almost, it could have killed any future Deadpool stuff. It was a shame because we knew how much at the time I knew how much Ryan Reynolds was a fan and, He'd been talking it up and, and hearing him yeah. being cast as Wade Wilson in that Wolverine movie got a lot of people excited. Yeah. I remember <laughs> even Robert Rodriguez was attached to this movie at yeah. some point. You know, yeah. this, this, this is great, man. Um, 
I, I, I loved it, man. I think the, the effects were great. I think that even though there's some obvious CG, I think it worked in with Colossus the tone. Colossus looks great. Film. Colossus looks fantastic. Um, the, uh, the highway fight scene that basically takes up the, almost the first half of the film, like in between flashbacks and stuff, is just yeah. awesome. One of my favorite kind of action scenes. Uh, I've seen it in a long time. I love how it's gory, but not gory for gore's sake. You know, it's um, it, it's just, they, the balance of everything, even the raunchy humor, is just fantastic. Like they could have gone totally overboard, like a Ryan Reynolds sex comedy. They ran yeah. a lot of that in. Um, it's it's still gleefully R rated, but um, I had a lot of fun, man. I don't know. The question the question is that I have about this movie is how the fuck. Did Tim Miller, the guy that directed it, do this fucking movie? I don't know. His first man. movie ever. Yeah, and it was, he's um, directing a big comic book movie. He he's in animation, right? Yeah, I know. He, like, I think that's his past. I'm not 100 percent sure what he did, but I know this is his directorial debut as a feature. Yeah, it's a. And you know, how cool is that? That you have a first time gig. You make a rated R Deadpool movie and you kill the box office. He kill and he, he it's a great he did a fantastic job. He knocked it out of the park. He yeah. did some animation stuff or whatever in Scott Pilgrim. That's all I know. Like, like it, everything else is like his filmography is like zero. Like he's done some visual effects, like he's done some writing and but not a lot. So he yeah. he, he he dude, he set up his career um through this film. And uh, it it does not feel like a debut at all. No, no, it's it, it and it, and it's one of those things that it's so off the wall. And the cool thing is, it doesn't relate to any of the comic book movies like that exist now. It, like, well, it, it kind of does that. It kind of doesn't. Like they use the right. same X Men mansion. Talking about the X Men, but they right. Make... But it feels like it's completely by itself yeah. in its own world, which right. is super cool. Yep. Yeah, it's great. Um. A lot of fun with it, so I would recommend Deadpool. And that's it, man. That's all I got. Cool. Yeah, that's all I uh, I have too. Awesome. All right. Well, let's. Uh, it's kind of a light news week and everything, and um, so I think we're gonna skip the news this week. We'll catch back up with Josh. What? Everybody loves the news. I know, but I want to get to Steve. We're, we're gonna lose like. Fucking there was like blitzkrill. two. We're releases. Two, we're gonna lose. We're gonna. Re, we're gonna lose two listeners. They'll be fine. You guys will be fine. Uh, next yes. week, Josh will be back with a kick-ass news segment. And um, but yeah, let's let's get into this interview here with Stephen Thrower, and let's talk about American Horror Project. Something happened in Janie's room while you were gone. Oh? All right, today we have the pleasure uh, to talk to Stephen Thrower. He was the co-curator of all the films, uh, the three films so far in the American Horror Project. So, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. You're welcome. So, um, how... I guess first thing we would want to know is like, how did you become involved with this uh, project? You're the co-curator. Um, how how does that work with you coming in on on this project here? Uh, it kind of started because well, I, I um, I'd worked with Arrow quite a bit before on some of their other releases. I'd done sleeve notes for Lucia Fulci releases that they'd done, and a variety of other things like John Russo's Midnight and uh, the Spanish film Pieces, various films like that. Um, as a result of that, I got into a few, a few conversations with them about uh, the poss- possibility of future releases. The idea for uh, an American uh, I- I- exploitation package kind of came about, main- I think, mainly from Francesco to begin with hmm. uh, at, at Arrow. Um, it was just a, a desire that they had to do something along those lines. And I know that they were very inspired by uh, by my book, by Nightmare USA, which uh, came out, you know, in about 2007, 2008, which is a, a book that's dedicated to 
low budget experiment, uh, not experimental, but low budget uh, exploitation movies, kind of independent movies made away from Hollywood, often quite regional productions, small productions. There was, uh, they were interested in doing something that kind of was drawing on the uh, experience I'd had in writing that book. And obviously, because at the time I wrote that, quite a few of those films were relatively unknown. Uh, it seemed like a good opportunity to put something together that would be kind of a bit more off the beaten track, where the films themselves might be things that pass people by. Uh, in a few cases, maybe very obscure. In other cases, just films that maybe we felt hadn't had a, a really good bite of the cherry. So mm-hmm. that's kind of the, the the inception for the project. Awesome. Um, well, we'll go through and we'll talk about each of these films here and, and your involvement your, and your thoughts on the films. Um, but first of all, were, were these these three that were chosen, were they – in your book, Neymar USA, yeah, um, okay. the um, all all three of them were covered in in the book. Cool. Malatesta was an instance where actually Malatesta I found relatively late on in the writing process. Uh, I think I was within about six months of completing the book, which took about five years altogether. I found the uh, the, the film had a DVD release that was uh, coordinated by the filmmaker himself. That came to my attention. It was a it was a movie title that had been on a list of must find out more about this kind of movies. Uh, but for years, all that anyone knew <clears throat> was that it had, it had apparently played a few dates in the Southern States. Uh, and it, all it had really was, it was a strange title on a list of titles to explore. Uh, fortunately, the, the filmmaker himself put out a, a, or co- coordinated a DVD release, which meant that just as I was coming to the end of writing Nightmare USA, I happened upon it and thought, oh my goodness, this is really actually pretty far out. Um, so I didn't write a whole chapter about Malatesta in the book. I mean, the, the structure of Nightmare USA is that the majority of the book is made of fairly substantial, you know, 20 page sort of features on a particular filmmaker or sometimes just a particular film. Uh, because I came across Malatesta, as I say, quite late on, I ended up, <clears throat> I, I, I wrote a review of it and then, uh, managed to contact Christopher and interviewed him and also contacted the guys that did the effects on the film and talked to them a bit. So I ended up with, like a t- I think, about two pages uh, of coverage in Nightmare USA. Um, but still, it was the most extensive coverage the film had received, and, mm-hmm. and um, it, you know, it was, a, it was a great, it was really great to make contact with Christopher. And when it came time to putting together the, the, the box set, then we were looking at films that had not already... In some cases, we were really hoping to find films that hadn't had any kind of major digital release at all. Um, Malatesta had never been out on video, uh, so it had passed the video era by, and you know, it never kind of uh, had that sort of exposure. The DVD release that Christopher coordinated was a relatively obscure one; it wasn't a big run, so it seemed ideal. It was a you know strange, unusual movie that maybe a lot of people hadn't seen, which I honestly thought they ought to see, and that was a lot more interesting than it. You know, than than it was uh, than its low profile might indicate. Mm-hmm. It definitely is a, a, a strange, <laughs> a strange little film. And I know um, um, a lot of people when I was kind of reading reviews online, or just just kind of people in these Facebook groups I'm in, and people talking about it online, were curious on why why the film would be in the set because they were favorable on the other two f- films. But this one was such an oddity that some people had issues with it being so odd. But I, I love I love the craziness of this film. Um, when, yeah. when did you first end up seeing the film in, in its entirety? Was it some in research for the book or? Yeah, so it, was during, it was during research for the book. So it was a film that I came across whilst writing the book. It was, I mean, in some in some cases with Nami USA, I was writing about films that I'd always had a passion for okay. that had popped up on video and then disappeared again. But I'd always, you know, held a bit of a torch for them. Um, and in other cases, there were films which. As I learned more and researched more, I found films that I wasn't even aware of when I began, and that was one of them. As far as uh, I mean, as far as response to the film goes, and in terms of the way it perhaps divides audiences, a the whole nature of this project is that it's not going to please everybody all mm-hmm. of the time. That's that's just not possible. You you know if if you want if you want a surefire 100% audience uh, response, then what are you going to do? Just, you know, put out umpteen versions of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, every, everybody loves that film. You can tick that box and say, hey, everybody loved it. Yeah. I, I love it. It's a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. But um, if you want to 
try and tread a little bit of tread some fresh ground, you know, sort of like put some footprints in the snow that haven't been there before, then sometimes you have to take a chance on movies that aren't necessarily going to have 100% across the, uh, across the board appeal. Uh, as long as, I, I would say, as long as half or so of the people who bought the, the, the box set got something out of the film, then I think the, the box set and the principle of, this, of the collection is working just fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you know, there are three films in there. You're not going to like all of them. Uh, the ch- chances are that one of them is going to fall short in relation to the others in, in your, in a person's opinion, you know? Yeah. Well, they're all such different films, I think, in the set. And, and like yeah. I said, this one is like just a strange little nightmare of a film that I loved. I mean, I love things that are a little crazier and, and this thing just was hitting all the right <laughs> checkboxes yeah. for me on just how, you know, I mean, it's super low budget. I mean, there's obviously, uh, you know, uh, we I joked around online when I was watching this. You know, what was the tinfoil budget you know, mm. for this film? <laughs> near the, near the you see, I, that, that's right. I, I, one of the things I really like about it is it, it is an amateur production, yeah. and I use that I use that word admiringly, not critically. It's a film made by people with no previous experience in filmmaking mm-hmm. who scraped some money together, got the the, the the various talents of their friends together, and said, "Let's just do it." And it doesn't matter really if then, you know, if, if we're constantly going to judge people's efforts by, uh, the benchmark created by, you know, the classics. Mm-hmm. And to me, that seems like a really unsatisfying way of approaching cinema because you're always wandering around feeling eternally disappointed that, you know, this isn't the great, you know, the great movie that, uh, I don't know, whatever your favorite would be, you know. Um, I mean, if you, if you're running around with The Exorcist and The Omen in your head, as great films, which I don't personally, but if that's your benchmark for great horror cinema, then chances are you're not going to like any of the films in this right. set, Frank. You know, yeah, um, no, I, I agree with that full heartedly. Yeah, I think I think this is this is something because just knowing because the carnival that's in Carnival Blood actually exists too. That's right, um, yeah. and that's that on itself is pretty nightmarish. I would say so. I, I don't know when when I very first saw this, it felt like, um, you know, kind of even shot on video horror, like how cheesy and kind of low budget it was. But it also, being that everything's kind of you know real, it does have that nightmarish quality. Um, yeah, just well, a I, very odd movie. One of the things I mean, one of the things I really like about regional horror cinema, the, the kinds of films that I was covering in Nightmare USA, one, one of the great appeals for me was films that had a sense of place. I mean, it might not be top of the list of things that people want from a horror movie. You know, obviously violence, shock, horror, um, you know, sort of um, death, preferably, as much <laughs> as possible. But, I mean, one of the things on my list, certainly, is uh, a sense of place, a sense of uh, the environment that the film is made. I enjoy these kinds of movies because yes, because they're made in, it's made in a real decrepit rundown fun fair. I mean, as a horror fan, if you can't get a kick out of walking around a decrepit rundown fairground off season, I don't know where you're, I don't know where you're coming from. I mean, sort of like that seems to me to be the kind of thing that horror fans do on their, on their vacations for fun, you know? And this is, this is the kind of thing that, that this movie taps into. It might not be the greatest story ever told. It might be a little on the rough and ready side, at the same time, you feel like you're you're kind of there in these strange, out of the way places, and they've got an atmosphere that, if you're receptive if you tune into it, is as much of a kick to me as the more obvious kind of pleasures of you know violence and and, and sex and violence, you know, which I, I, I adore. But location and the pleasures of an eerie location seem to me to be as, just as valid and interesting as anything mm-hmm. else. Well, I, uh, the entrance of uh, I, I can't pronounce his name is it Hervé? Hervé, yeah. Oh, Villa, Villa Chase? Mm-hmm. Um, I've always loved whenever he shows up in things and and <clears throat> I mean I was a huge fan as a kid of of uh, Fantasy Island so you know seeing him show up here was fantastic as the uh, yeah. character of Bobo. <laughs> did, yeah. uh, did the director have any stories on how they brought him in or, or got him to be a part of the project? Um I think that I, I, I can't remember, to be honest, what the, what the situation was with him. I mean, he was, I mean, he was certainly one of the only, you know, professional, you know, previously exposed actors uh-huh. that was, uh, that were working on, on film. Um, I think, he, uh, I think uh, Christopher goes into it a little, in a little bit more detail on the, on the actual commentary mm-hmm. track. But, um, yeah. I mean, he's a, 
you know, he's a, a, a unique talent and an odd, uh, an, uh, uh, an odd character uh, among several odd characters in the film. I mean, there's um, one of the people I really like in that movie is uh, William Preston, who's the uh, the kind of janitor around around the fairground, who's He's got a, a kind of a wandering eye, you know. He's got that mm-hmm. kind of condition where where the eyeballs don't point in the same direction, and um, and a great sort of carnival face, you know, the sort of the, 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 the sort of the sort of the sort of person that would you know sort of like put the, really put the wind up kids if he kind of lurched around the corner at a sort of a fairground, you know. And he's playing. I mean, you know, he's playing it up for all it's worth. He obviously oh, relishes yeah. playing that role. It's not. You know, I don't want to get into that question. It's not really necessary. But you know, the whole question of whether or not it's exploitative. He's just a he's just a, a cool, crazy looking guy, uh, yeah. and uh, and he you know he's he is actually pretty alarming in the film. And there's points when he grabs a hold of people or chases people, chases one of the uh, unfortunate female characters around in the film that actually has that little frisson of of uh, of real scares to it. You know, so. Brad, did you see any other actors in here that you were familiar with from other films? Um, um, I can't, I can't, I can't really remember. Um, I mean, it was, I want to say like faces wise, mm-hmm. but like not, not so much like notable names where I actually knew it. It's just that I've seen them pop up before, but I don't think, yeah, like William, William Preston was, uh, was definitely one. Um, cause he plays, uh, what is he? He plays what's his name? It's like something weird. Right? Um uh like, sticker? Sticker? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> but um no, that's um I, I can't No, not not that I would say like, hey, this is person notable other than, you know, Fantasy well, Island I think, guy. I think I mean even even of a Villachez, I think was I think his his TV career came after this film. I think um, the Love Boat was after this, oh, okay. uh, and he was in seventy three, right? This movie. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And he was in he was in a Bond film as well, wasn't he? He was. Uh, yeah, he, he was, was in Man with the Man Gun. Gun. Yeah, which again, which is I think it's immediately after Malatesta. So you know yeah. that's a that must have been an experience for him. You know, from from the set of Malatesta's kind of blood to the set of a, a major Bond movie. You know. But, uh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. I guess Fanny Sandy came later because he was in Forbidden Zone before that, and then, uh, hmm. huh? But I mean, of course, I'm most familiar with him through, through Fanny Sandy. So at the time, he was uh, relatively, relatively unknown um, in this in this relatively unknown <laughs> horror film. Well, but, I mean, one of, the, one of the appeals of low budget horror films and, and these kind of movies made very much on the fringes of the mainstream industry is that you don't recognize a lot of the people. In yeah. Them. Uh, I, you sometimes feel when you're watching mainstream movies and you see the same people popping up, the same actors, that it's, it's a li- little bit like uh, in theatre class when the same kids get to get hold of the costume uh, first, you know, sort of like they're, they're kind of hogging all the limelight. Mm-hmm. Think, I'm sick. I, I don't want to see Johnny Depp playing fucking, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde uh, as, as if he's working his way through every single role right. that could possibly be of interest. He needs to take a couple year hiatus, in my opinion. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, but, it, but it's the same for an awful lot of mainstream movies where you, obviously part of the appeal of a mainstream movie is that it taps into that desire to see stars and the repetition of seeing the same people. So it's a different game. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that low-budget movies do, uh, one of the reasons, for instance, why the Texas Chainsaw Massacre works so well is that you don't recognize any of the people in it before. I mean, now, of course, we know them. But the first time you saw that movie... None of the faces in that in, in that film were familiar, and so you had no idea who the plot was going to favour. You didn't know. You, you you couldn't tell. I mean, nowadays you can you can hazard a guess as to who's going to survive based on who's the biggest profile star in the cast. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, um, yeah. And and it's I, I think it's more unsettling not to recognise people and to to be seeing them for the first time in the story. You know, rather well, it's than it's like a sense of realism. Yeah, it does because these yeah. are just some some people. You've never met them before, but now you're looking into their, you know, you're getting a window into their unfortunate lives as they die horribly. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mal- Malatest, I mean, for for a movie like this, you know, it's just then that's one the one thing is that when, whenever we bring up Arrow um, and companies like this, and Arrow especially, and even like even Vinegar Syndrome, is the care that gets put into these obscure films getting these, you know, deluxe treatments, you know, yeah. um, 
on I, th- I think Arrow is one of the few companies that it's like every every release they do is a special event. Um they're going to put a ton of extras and things like that whereas a, a company like Screen Factory reserves that that kind of thing for their mainly for their collector's edition titles mm-hmm. as far as the new stuff or things like that but Arrow seems to give each of the films that acquires the kind of Arrow touch which is a uh, which is pretty great and is why this is why you know things like this whenever a box set or something like like American Horror Project comes out I'm always you know have to scrape the bottom of the barrel of my bank account to make sure I can get get a copy but I always want to make sure I can grab a, a, a copy like this well, um, there's a situation developing now where the mainstream the, the major companies are not really putting their weight behind blu-ray releases mm-hmm. uh, you get situations where uh, you know big Big budget movies have been put out on Blu-ray without striking a new master. You know, um, DVD masters kind of just bumped up to to Blu-ray, yeah. um, and quite often the Blu-rays have got a fraction of the dedication when it comes to extras that you get in the smaller releases. I I, I think that's kind of funny in a way. It's 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 as if it's as if the the, the obviously the mainstream the big companies are probably looking at streaming and Netflix and things and thinking. Oh, you know, physical copies are, are on the way out. What's the point of expending any more uh, on 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 documentaries and uh, behind the scenes stuff and mm. the rest of it? Whereas for the collector's market and for the genre film uh, market in particular, um, the fans of these kinds of movies can't get enough of yeah. the ex- the extra material. And and uh, an Arrow have been very uh, diligent, I think, in uh, in building up a really Really strong package with uh, a reliable identity, where you, you you see that they're involved in something and think, well, you know, regardless of whether or not you happen to like the film, you, you can be pretty sure that they're going to push the boat on um, on the presentation. Yeah. Now, were you involved with the tracking down the the elements for these the vault materials, or did you to, turn that uh, to someone else? To, I think with I think with Malatesta, well, with Malatesta or with 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 all of them. I mean, I, I'm involved in in as much as I'm trying to find the rights holders okay. for the films. Uh, the, uh, once you find the rights holders, then obviously the, 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 the question of elements comes into play. We've got a, a guy at Arrow uh, called James White who mm-hmm. is in charge of uh, the restoration side of things, and he then liaises with whoever the rights holder is to try and find the best possible version and the, the best elements, I, you know, ideally uh, negatives or, you know, pre-print sort of elements. Yeah. Um, it's not not always possible. Um, sometimes you, sometimes if you want the film and you and you really believe that it, you you want to do it and you could only find a thirty five mil print, then you go with the print and, mm. and do what restoration you can. But wherever wherever possible, we we are trying to find negatives, you know, yeah. or, or inter, you know internets and things like that. So. Well, all the all three of these look um, fantastic, and you know did a did a hell of a bang up job. I mean, Arrow really doesn't disappoint on on that end of the spectrum especially with um with with these with these titles alone i was really happy that something like this was coming out because there are a lot of american horror titles that um kind of got shoved under the rug and Mm -hmm. you 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 visit a lot of those in your uh in your book nightmare usa that i've been a fan of um since its release uh Mm -hmm. turned me on to some some films that i had no idea existed and therefore, you know that a lot of other people don't know they existed either. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's it's nice to actually see uh, three of these films out of the book. Um, get because there was the Malatesta's Carnival of Blood was the one that I I haven't seen. Um, it's in because I saw the premonition before a little like not it's an entirety, but this is the only one that I was actually looking for. Um, mm-hmm. For a little while uh, during my VHS days, when I was in my teens, trying to hunt down uh, everything, and I remember hearing about it, and I just could never get my hands on it. So it's it's. Yeah. Um, I think people need to look at that aspect because that's why I always say is that with companies like Vinegar Syndrome and Arrow, sometimes it, and like you said previously, it's just not about if the movie's good or not. It's also putting the film out there because we're always, um, you know, I always say on the show that you don't want movies to die and yeah. movies are dying all the time because no one re-releases them. Even if it has a shitty DVD release, you're still putting new life into that movie and giving it a few more years. Yeah. Um, so it's nice to actually see, you know, people pick up the underdogs 
um, you know, and find something special about it, you know, because there are special things about these movies. Yeah. I mean, just, just to, um, just to be clear, I mean, I, I always, uh, anything that I was involved in would be something that I thought was good in, in some way. I, I, putting something out just to, to ensure its survival wouldn't, be necessarily something I would do. I mean, in each of the cases with these films, they're all films that I thought had had interesting and unusual qualities that deserved exposure. Um, all I was saying earlier is that um, if you if you measure if you measure films constantly against the very very best, you found you know, it, you know in mainstream terms, if you were holding Citizen Kane, if you were using Citizen Kane as a stick to beat, you know, David Cronenberg's Shivers. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, you know. Like, okay, don't use what's you know commonly regarded as the best film ever made as a as a stick to beat uh, movies that are very very good, yeah. but not the greatest. You know. Um, so in these cases, there, these are all movies that I think are, are made by people with integrity. They're uh, people who are trying to make uh, the best film they can. There's no laziness. There's no. Um, there's no. Slap, there's nothing slapdash even about Malatesta, which is mm-hmm. as, as I say is quite an amateur production. Uh, it's not slapdash in the sense of oh, who cares? Just stick it out and make some money. It's not like that. It's they're, they're working as they're doing the best they can with the very limited funds they've got, and they're putting imagination ahead of everything else. And sometimes maybe the uh, the technical uh, aspects are slightly less polished than you would expect from a, a, some of the maybe the other movies in the package. But because they've prioritised imagination, they're just going for it, and they're not letting anything as boring as budget stop them <laughs> yeah yeah that's great um let's move let's move into uh the next film on the list here and, and this is probably turned out to be my my favorite in in the set um it's the witch who came from the sea mm-hmm. and it's definitely you know the poster art is misleading because this is you know uh it, it looks like kind of a weird monster flick but what it really boils down to is more of kind of a psychological horror film that's right. Um, involving our uh, main character played by uh, Millie Perkins. And um, I just really loved the film. I loved the look of it. I actually loved that I was surprised that it wasn't just a, a run-of-the-mill, going to be some weird uh, monster movie or anything like that. Um, yeah. What was the – What? How did, you, how did you stumble across this one? And uh, make it a part of the set. Uh, Which you came from the sea, probably in Britain, uh, is is the film in the set that had the highest profile uh, because it was it, it was uh, caught up in the video nasties controversy, which you might have heard about, which was um, in the early nineteen eighties when video first really took off. Uh, it was unregulated, and there was no certification and no um, no government control over the content of the films, and so. For the first time in this country, we were getting exposed to a lot of films that had been maybe had played, you know, relatively unimpeded in America, but which were coming to Britain for the first time. Uh, and among those films, obviously, horror films were a very uh, were a very powerful part of the early development of the video uh, industry because um, the major studios and the mainstream studios didn't get involved in video for quite a long time. They were kind of quite wary of it, which left the, which, and and yet there was a huge demand for new product. And so low budget independent horror movies were one of the main uh, bodies of work that kind of rose to fill that gap. Um, and it meant that a lot of, a lot of people who'd never seen the, the wilder or the more extreme reaches of, uh, of American horror or indeed Italian or Spanish horror, uh, we're seeing them for the first time, and it, and it had quite a shocking effect on some people. And they they something about those movies upset uh, the people in control. And it wasn't long; it was about a period of about three or four years before um, uh, before control was reestablished, censorship was brought in for video, and uh, there was a massive media campaign in the UK uh, run by the right wing press uh, to uh, demonise horror uh, and uh, video horror. Uh, and this wretched term video nasty was was coined by one of the newspapers to describe the kinds of horror films that were not decent horror films like you know the hammer films or the frankenstein and dracula etc but these nasty cheap dirty filthy cruel mean spirited films that they perceived uh, things like last house on the left and cannibal holocaust and all these films to be 
which you came from the sea, you might find it surprising now looking at the film uh, because it's nowhere near as bad as, uh, nowhere near as over the top horrific as something like Cannibal Holocaust, but it did get caught up in the, in the legislation at the time mm. and became, uh, became a banned, a banned movie on video in the UK. Um, it was on this famous list of you know, whatever it was, 37 film titles or 39 film titles that were banned outright in the UK. Um, when you actually, when you actually watch the film and try and work out what it is that people were getting so upset about, I suppose really it comes down to the fact that you're dealing with a female, uh, psychotic who is, uh, in one of the, one of the film's central pivotal scenes, uh, being the literal sort of femme castratrice, you know, she's, uh, cutting men off in their prime. Uh, and although you don't see anything as explicit as an actual dick being lopped off, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you have to go to, you know, Michael Hugo's hardcore for that. But uh, uh, you don't see it, but certainly the emotional and psychological impact of the idea is lingered on quite substantially in that scene. It's be- brilliantly directed, very disturbing scene. Um, you don't see very much, but it certainly kind of gives you the shudders, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I, I can only assume that some, you know, some censorious individual back in the early eighties uh, had such a negative reaction to the uh, to to the whole idea of this central image that uh, this central scene that they complained to the police or whatever, or the police pulled it in and a police officer was upset by it. Um, it was all it was all very kind of um, it was all very random. The video nasty controversy. A lot of the films that were pulled in. When you look at them, you, certain films you can look at and say, "Well, okay, I, I don't, I don't agree with censorship, but I can understand why this film would have upset certain people because it's pretty extreme." And then other ones, you think, "What? what what's what, what's the problem?" Uh, you know, I mean, there were there were there was a huge uh, shortfall in in terms of the explicitness of certain films compared to others, and I can't help feeling that one of the main influences on those decision making uh, that decision making was the style of the, of the films the sense that they were not the, the the decorum of a regular mainstream drama wasn't there that there was a sense of danger that you didn't know where the film was going to take you the, the idea that the director was you couldn't be trusted that you didn't know this was a dangerous person who was going to take you into very stormy emotional waters um, and that's certainly the feeling you get from which I think yeah well, yeah, I definitely I can see that the 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 sexual violence you know portrayed in the film and in the situations. I guess it's it's weird how once sex comes into play, as far as censorship goes, you know, and then you, people start turning their heads and getting uncomfortable, and then you combine that with the violent nature of it. You know, I, I can see, even though it's not explicit, you know, that somebody would definitely have a problem with it at that time. At that time, it, yeah. it it makes sense to me. But yeah, I mean, but that's what really you know. Um, really made me so interested in, in the film was you know just how things are are portrayed. Well, it's I mean it's, it's, you see the, the, these sort of responses where you become uh, distressed, upset, and alarmed by the content of a movie. That's what horror is. That's what it does. That's what it's there for. Uh, wanting to censor a film on the basis that it's upsetting and distressing a horror film on the basis that it's upsetting and distressing. It's a bit like wanting to censor a comedy because it makes you laugh too much. You know, it's crazy. This is what horror is all about. And this is really one of the reasons why the horror genre will always, I think, have this element of the disreputable, um, of being the, uh, you know, being the, being the relative who's not invited to the family gatherings, you know, uh, even, even as it enters the mainstream, there's always, this, there's always this element of it that seems, like it's trailing muddy footprints through the door. You know, there's a sort of a quality to it that isn't quite proper. And that's, we should never lose that. I think really that's something that should never get lost. It's, it's part of the, it's part of the appeal, I think, and part of the value of the horror film, but it's not so easily assimilated. Uh, and the more polished and, and, um, and comfortable the experience becomes, the less valid I think it is. And certainly something like which, uh, is going out of its way to to get under your skin to create distressing and unnerving situations, um, and as, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's exactly what horror films should be doing. Yeah, and I I think with with that because I, I agree with you because I mean we have the videos nasties list and sometimes you look at that list and you think of uh, 
you know, like this, this film in particular, uh, you know, I know visiting hours was on that list, uh, night school, some of those movies you're like, well, I guess night school has a couple, a couple moments, but it's almost sometimes that one scene makes that film on the, like the, it gets on the videos nasties list. But yeah. I, I think with, with this one, I mean, there's nothing, I guess nothing like gory. It's just the unsettling uh, feeling that you have, um, even from the very opening film with the the woman on the beach with her with her, you know Millie Perkins on the beach with her kids and looking over at the you know the bodybuilders. Just yeah. even that alone, it gives this weird tone to the film that makes that's you a, uncomfortable. That, that's I think that's a sign of the uh, it is it is a sign of the sophistication of the film. I think that yeah, it's. It's not um, the the um, the unsettling and, unpl- and 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 distressing qualities of the film don't just reside in a couple of splashy, violent moments like in a, right. a slashy a slashy it movie. Gives that vi- vibe right off the bat, yeah, like you, you're uncomfortable. So- yeah, it's soaked in it, and I think part the part of the part of the reason for that is that it's the film is trying to show you the world through the eyes of a psychotic, uh, where, yeah. where where. where we spend a lot of time with the Millie Perkins character and we see, we see the world as she's seeing it. And we listen to her account of what her her memories are every now and again, another character will contradict those memories, but the film is so much in her world that we're sort of like that. that, That's really what the design of the film is all about is to give you like a a view of the world through the eyes of a, of a a troubled uh, psychotic character. And it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, that's actually a fairly tricky thing to do. It requires a certain amount of psychological um, uh, acuity and, and, and skill on the part of the filmmaker. Uh, and it's absolutely dependent on very, very good acting. Um, yeah. Now, in, in, in low-budget horror and in, in exploitation movies, you can go a long way without good actors. You can actually get away with it. Herschel Gordon Lewis got through most of his career without a good actor, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, it, and it, it doesn't... You know, it, it, it it doesn't it doesn't ruin the Wizard of Gore, you know. It doesn't ruin uh, the gruesome twosome that there are no really good actors in the movie. Right. Yeah. Uh, so you you can get away with it, and you, and with kind of weirdo horror films, you know, strange films that are just out to be out to be weird. You know, you can get away with kind of shaky casting as well. You know, shaky, shaky acting. But um, for psychological uh, drama, I think that's one of the areas where. Uh, acting really does come to the fore and you need somebody who knows what they're doing. And Millie Perkins, I think is absolutely amazing in this. I think she's, Oh yeah. She's, 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 she, she manages to be sympathetic and frightening at the same time. It's like watching somebody. It's like watching somebody that you know, who's suffering from mental illness and, and you want to reach out and help them. But at the same time, you can see that they're becoming more and more dangerous to other people and themselves. And so you're caught in this weird bind where you feel s- sympathy for them, but you're aware that they're doing terrible things. Uh, and the film kind of puts you in that strange, emotionally conflicted position where you you feel for her, but at the same time, she's really caught up in a very destructive sort of cycle of, of behavior. So, yeah, and I, I, I that's and that's exactly what you said. I think that's the sole reason why it was put on the video nasties list. And I also think a lot of people probably didn't understand. You know, because I mean, from what we're, you know, from the from the list that's on there in that in that era, and especially coming from the seventies, you know, in the from the seventies to the eighties, I was actually talking to a friend about this the other day. The eighties, we all had happy endings. The seventies and sixties, we had kind of really harsh endings, and yeah. Yeah. you know, lead characters dying, and just stuff at the end where it was just fucked up. And mm-hmm. um, with, with with the witch. Um, who came from the MC? It's it's definitely one of those films that uh, it's fucked up, and and it also it's just not visually. It's you know it makes you it makes you feel weird. It makes you feel different. Like as soon yep. as it opens up, just the the tone, the 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 music, just the beautiful cinematography, like you know you just know something's wrong just by the opening of the film. You just know that something's wrong, and I, I don't yeah, think absolutely. a lot of filmmakers can do that. No, absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, there's a there's a confluence of influences and effects that are happening in that film. The the, the music is is minor key. It's very haunting. Uh, it's not. Um, it's got this. It's got this slightly neurotic quality at times when it sort of lurches into sort of kind of violent sort of spasms. But the, it's a kind of it's this edgy, 
uh, unpredictable quality that seems to mirror the psyche of the lead character. But underneath it all, there's this very melancholy uh, tone. I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker, to be honest, for melancholy in horror films. That is, yeah. it kind of you know extreme violence and melancholia added together. That's that's it. I'm 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 all over it. Uh, something like George Romero's Martin, for instance, is a great example. You know where. You're dealing with actually a very good comparison with this film because again you're dealing with a sympathetic lead character who's doing terrible things, um, but, but the the overall tone of the film has got a sadness to it because the sadness comes from the the, the sympathetic empathetic relationship that you develop with the character, uh, and and again comparing those two films, it's the, a, a large part of that is kind of driven by a very very sensitive musical score as well that kind of adds that sort of melancholic element. So. Yeah. Well, the, the fantastic thing about this film is as you start kind of diving into, you know, the the team that made the film, I mean, you have the, the cinematography we've already mentioned. I mean, that's Dean Cundy, <laughs> which is – Yeah, absolutely. One of the greatest. Incredible. Uh, one of the best cinematographers in the, in the business. Um, then you had Matt – is it Kimber? Is that how you pronounce his last name? Sim- Simber, I think. So, yeah, I always used to say Kimber. Okay. Yeah. Um, but he came from like um, in the late 60s – early seventies, um, these not really sex exploitation, but like these sex documentaries. Yeah. Um, he and she, uh, man and wife an educational film for married adults, um, African sexualis. Black. Well, he's yeah. also, a, well, he's also black exploitation director. Yes. Yeah. He did, uh, yeah. Lady Coco and, uh, the Tangerine, Tangerine man. So and the like, black six, which is a very oh, violent nice. biker gang mm-hmm. movie. Nice. So it's like, He's got he's got very very broad reaching and yeah. wide ranging exploitation. Yeah. Uh, this kind of uh, comes out of nowhere in a way. At the same yeah. time, like a different caliber. Um, and I think Vinegar Syndrome just released Sex and Astrology recently by him too. Oh, okay, right. So nice. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, you can almost his journey in the films he did up to The Witch Who Came from the Sea. It seems like The Witch Came from the Sea is of a different caliber. Um, but you can also see, like, even you know, in the in kind of, in kind of the kind of the, the sex scenes and stuff like that, like he obviously knew how to shoot, you know, um, that element, you know, yeah. for, I think for his background, and then the exploitation stuff kind of goes from there. From I think there. it's I think it's one of those examples where there's a just a really good team has come together. Yeah, uh, because it, it, the film would fall flat on its ass if uh, Millie Perkins couldn't act. Right. So she's amazing. She was in a relationship with the writer of the film, Robert Tom, um, and uh, he's at the top of his game as well. And this script was, apparently was very important to him. Mm. Uh, and you've got Dean Cundy shooting the film. I think Simba, maybe, is, maybe his previous credits didn't indicate he was going to do something quite as... Um, uh, you know, sort of sensitive and 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 uh, and well crafted, well crafted. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but, he, but working with Corman all that time, you know, yeah. he, but he, but, but he stepped he stepped up. You know, sort of like the thing yeah. is, he, in in the presence of the right collaborators, people change and raise their game, don't they? Uh, and I, I think you know, we, we we often forget that cinema is a collaborative medium and look for look for um, you know to celebrate single figures like directors. And I think maybe this is one of those instances where the right the right constellation sort of came together and the right people found themselves in relation to each other. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and everybody synergy that's synergized. Everyone just clicked and it just, they made something perhaps a little better than they would have made on their own or, you know, in a different situation. <clears throat> yeah. It's just, I mean, it's just a fantastic film. I mean, uh, all levels. I mean, this is something that I wish I would have seen sooner. Even when I was in college, like taking kind of film classes and things like this, I feel like this is a, a film that I should have been seeing like alongside, you know, movies like, Chinatown or whatever like it's for me that it was that good like I was surprised <laughs> how good how how well it was made and I mean has has the director done any I mean he has movies after this but I don't they're all movies that I haven't seen Brad have you seen any of his movies through the 80s like uh, nothing that's um, substantial that I can remember at okay. least I saw I mean I knew Matt Simba first and foremost uh, as the director of Butterfly which was a Piazzadora star vehicle uh, with Stacey Keach. Okay. Uh, now, Pia Zadora was, uh, she, she's now better known through the fact that John Waters was a big fan of Pia Zadora and cast her in, in, um, she in, is it, God, is she in Crybaby, is, is it? She's in that one. But, um, but yes, uh, she, she was a sort of, um, she was an actress who, uh, got her start in the industry through being married to a, a powerful and influential man in the industry. 
and he kind of created this sort of star vehicle for her, uh, which Simba directed called Butterfly. I, I saw that in the early 80s on video and thought it was a hoot, just a, a kind of a, a very camp sort of film with mm. uh, over, just the, the performances and the, the overheated quality of this kind of sexual melodrama was quite comical, but in a fun way, not, you know, in, a, in an enjoyable way, but not a film that I ever thought. I didn't think I, I didn't imagine I would ever revisit it. You know, it was just kind of fun to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I saw which you came from the sea and realized it was made by the same guy, I had this kind of disconnect and thought, well, oh. <laughs> these are two completely different kinds of uh, movies and how, how fascinating that he's capable of doing both. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but I haven't seen the rest of his eighties. Uh, so, oh no, I tell a lie. I saw hundred. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, about, yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it seems like you may, you know, you're you're right about the team, the collaboration. I mean, with the the collaboration for which he came from the sea, it kind of as a filmmaker himself with that team, it seems like he peaked there with that film. From from what I'm looking at, I mean, I haven't seen. I mean, the only one I'm I'm looking through, you know, only one I'm interested in, and I I you know, I judge a lot of movies based on their on their cover, which uh, sometimes gets me into trouble. But the, uh, the poster for A Time to Die it looks fantastic. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I've seen that one. I've yeah. seen most of his black exploitation uh, films and some of his uh, sex stuff, but yeah, this is he definitely uh, he definitely hit it with this one, mm-hmm. and he, he's never done anything like it that I've seen at least. Yeah, and it looks like he's very uh, I don't know, just um, it's it's always worth. I mean, it's always worth reserving. I won't say judgment because we're not sitting in judgment here, but you know, I'd always re- reserving opinion. Uh, until you've seen some of the more obscure things on the on the list. I mean, I'm looking at his filmography here, and there are films I haven't seen. Because the title doesn't inspire me, something that girl from Boston might prove to be a great movie, but right. the title is grabbing me, so I haven't kind of caught up with it. Uh, and I suppose it's, you know, it's the we're in the same boat having not seen all of his films as I was years ago when I'd seen Butterfly. You know, if someone had said to me, you will one day bend over backwards to get one of this guy's films released on home entertainment formats, I would, I would, I would have been amazed, you know. But uh, yeah, because I've seen the witch, you know. So, well, um, but yeah, which which came to see definitely fantastic. It, it surprised me, which is always which is always fun when something surprises me. And uh, is 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 the one if there if you're gonna pick one film out of this whole set that I love the most is probably this one. But um, but like I mean, I love the variety so far in in the American Horror Project, and we'll talk. We can talk a little bit after this next one about uh, the future of this, of this uh, project. But um, let's move into the premonition, which is uh, another one that kind of surprised me. And, and I, I loved, um, uh, how did you get involved um, with this one? What, what made you decide this would be one of the first films you choose for this, uh, for this series? Well, the premonition was a film that uh, I de- devoted a chapter to the career of the director of the premonition in, in, in the USA. Uh, I, I love the film. I, lo- I like the, I love the fact that it's dealing with concerns that are kind of adult concerns, uh, you know, uh, the, the family life adoption, the, 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 the fear that, you know, if you adopt a child that the, the, the real parent might be sort of like planning to snatch them back again, those sorts of um, emotional concerns that are, that are more sort of, you know, parental concerns than teenage concerns. Uh, so it seemed in the, the, you were mentioning the variety of the, of the, of the films in the, in the, in the package. And that's an important uh, part of, that's certainly an important part of getting this first box together was wanting to make sure that you were offering a fairly wide selection of types of film. Malatesta is crazy. Uh, which you came from the sea is uh, psychological uh, portraiture, and, and as we've just been talking about, um, the premonition is a sort of um, it's it's, it's a more of a, a sort of a substantial um, drama about uh, sort of like the lives of the lives of adult characters and sort of like the emotions that kind of uh, follow on from parenthood. It seemed like it came from a completely different place to the other two, mm-hmm. uh, and. I like the I like the fact that the box doesn't have a, a, a single theme running through it. That you, you're dealing with three not only three different subjects but three approach three different approaches. I think the premonition feels more. It's the most mainstream feeling of the films. I suppose it's that it feels it feels like a drama that would that 
could possibly have been made outside of the genre, but has kind of then become uh, soaked in the uh, metaphysical interests of its director because um, Robert Schnitzer um, has for all of his life uh, been very interested in, in uh, the paranormal and uh, he's, he, he runs a TV station uh, which is dedicated to, you know, the you know, sort of like the expanded consciousness and those sorts of things. Uh, so you're dealing with a, 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 a relatively four square story to begin with, but then it kind of slightly starts to, turn stranger and goes more and more off the rails until at the end you're dealing with plot developments that are kind of hanging by a thread in terms of re- conventional plausibility because you've entered into a sort of a, a a more metaphysical sort of realm where you're asked to believe that dreams and visions are uh, ways of communicating with with the dead and things like this so well it's great and once i saw richard lynch show up you know, I knew that I would, <laughs> I would love this film once he appears on screen. He's yeah, he's brilliant. He's great. I mean, he can do so much with just a look. You know, um, just his face adds so much depth, I think, to a to a character when you when you cast him. But well, uh, that, that that opening scene where you see him uh, doing sort of dance exercises mm-hmm. in in the fairground where he's working, uh, that is such an incredibly compelling beginning and. To be honest, it, it plays against several of my prejudices uh, because, you know, it's got elements of mime and he's got clown make- makeup on. And those two things normally would be – I would normally walk swiftly away from, from them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I sort of like, you know, give, you know I, I, I don't find mimes poignant in general uh, and, uh, and clowns can go hang as far as I'm concerned most of the time. <laughs> there's something about him and there's something about this uh, incredibly serious – sort of focused, stern quality that he's got when he's doing these sort of moves that kind of pulls you into the film. You think what you, you immediately want to know what's going on. You yeah. want to know who he is, what, what his, what, and, and what kind of a film is it that starts with this really quite almost balletic sort of um, piece of physical theater, you know, you definitely can't ignore it. You definitely, you know, um, I mean, these days we're so distracted with our, with our phones and everything in, in front of us, you know, um, I felt that once the film started, I kind of was, you know, sit back in my chair and put everything out and, and, and I wanted to kind of go along for the ride with this one and just kind of figure out, you know, what was going on. And this film, I feel like you're brought through a journey with these, the characters, with things that go on in the film. Um, I was, I think I was expecting just kind of a, uh, kind of paranormal thriller, like, you know, I, I have no idea what I was expecting, you know, but yeah. more of a ghost story, I guess. Um, but this had a lot more going on to it uh, than, than than just that, you know. Brad, yeah. wh- what were your thoughts on the, the premonition? Was this your first time seeing it? Oh, this is my first time actually seeing it in its entirety. Um, I, I remember catching pieces of it when I was little, but this is the first time that I've seen it all on its way through. It's actually, I don't know, it's probably my favorite part or my, my favorite film in the set just because the psychological part, like even though the, the, the witch has that, but there's like this, um, not psychological, but like almost like, uh, say, I want to say psychosis, but it really gets into your head, especially when you have kids. Yeah. 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 And, well, it, I- and it makes you think on that end of the spectrum of, you know, losing a child, trying to find a child, um, you know, and just kind of like this, weird because like the movie itself is very odd how it's set up and kind of like the dream state that it's in it's um it it feels like a dream feels like a nightmare it feels like you know you're in these parents heads uh, I don't know it's just it's just so many things running together that's the reason why I like it because it's almost like a state of confusion sometimes for these characters it feels like yeah, it keeps you know. it keeps kind of taking a trip out into left field, doesn't it? And there, mm-hmm. it's not, it's not a straightforward linear sort of narrative. You, you've got the you've got this you know conventional couple, you know a professional couple, loving parents of this little girl, uh, and then you've got this unconventional couple, um, but with love a part of their world as well. Even though, <laughs> even, though they're, even though they're quite unbalanced in many ways, right. Um, and the film kind of takes you between the two and, and each, each is so, you know, the, 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 obviously the, the, the troubled characters draw your attention more 
part of the part of the structure of the film is that the the uh, the the more conservatively depicted characters have to embrace some of the madness of the other two in order to retrieve the situation and try and, and, and battle for the girl. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's inevitable that if you set up a, a, a storyline that's based on uh, a spaced out uh, psychotic couple and uh, a, a well-to-do professional couple living in the suburbs, well, surprise, surprise, you, you find yourself drawn more to the psychotic couple and their problems. Uh, <laughs> and and one, of the films, one of the things the film has to do in terms of its structure is to try and pull... Is trying is trying to create a sort of um to, for, for the for the suburban couple to fight back against that in, in narrative terms as well as uh, as well as in terms of our interest mm-hmm. uh, to, to and, and that's done by the means of the mother's visions and and the uh, the tension with the uh, the father having to come to terms with the paranormal when he initially starts off as a as a total rationalist yeah well that's what's crazy about this film is you get brought into the world of the two. The, 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 the crazy parents, I believe, you know, but you get kind of get to know their situation first and you kind of, in a way, can empathize with their situation. And as you start realizing what they're up to, you know, your, your kind of uh, allegiance to the characters and the story starts to switch to the other ones. But it's, it's a, I don't, I haven't seen that happen for too many times in films where a movie seems to be, you know, kind of wrestling you away from what turns out to be more of the, the bad guys. <laughs> In the yeah, film, where yeah. at first you are kind of, uh, well, you, it, you get to know them first. It's interesting that uh, I mean, this is a film about the family divided, or it's, yeah. a, it's a it's a it's a film in which the family is given a mirror Im- a mirror image of itself, uh, and so it, it plays into uh, it plays into this <clears throat> quality that the family has in society of being this sort of untouchable bedrock of the structure of society that you know we're, we're led to believe that um beyond all of the social contracts and all of the social um uh, uh situations that the family is the, is the bedrock of of uh, of the psyche in many ways and this and this film is creating a, a a split or doubled family where you've got um you've got two sets of parents warring over a, a, over a child um, so it, there's something intrinsically disturbing and unsettling about that setup because it's taking one of the, you know, the 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 sanctified core elements of of our identities, you know, family identity, and then creating this kind of dark mirror to it as well. Well, it it, it is pretty fantastic, um, and I, I recommend you know I recommend all, all three of these films. I and mean, this box set was just so fun to go through. Um, we're at the wrap up here soon, but what was the what's on the agenda next for? Are you curating like a part two, or is there is this something that Arrow definitely wants to pursue? Oh, for sure, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, we, we I can't tell you what the titles right. <laughs> because uh, it's all under wraps at the moment. But yes, there's there, there's going to be a part two. In fact, the idea is for uh, you know as many as ma- as many as we can do as, as long as we can keep finding the materials. The big challenge, the big challenge really is to find. A, well, a to find uh, adequate materials and, and trace, um, you know, the rights holders and all, that kind of practical sort of um, legwork involved in trying to track these things down. Uh, and and also, obviously, you know, there are there are other companies releasing things, right. uh, so uh, you you have to, you know, you have to try and find something that that hasn't already had other people's fingerprints all over it, uh, and then to try and strike a balance between. Um, you know, obs- obscurity and uh, and interest. Yeah. Uh, there, 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 are, there are some there are some films which I covered in Nightmare USA for my own personal pleasure. Which, uh, which hello? Yeah, I'm here. We dropped we, we dropped Brad, but we'll wrap up here with Adam. All it's right. all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there, there, there are some, there are some films uh, that I covered in Nightmare USA which. Um, Aren't suitable for the for the arrow treatment. Uh, <clears throat> they're, they're they're just they you know may, may, they maybe just don't fit the bill quite. But if if I was running my own label, I'd put them out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so 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 it's a question of finding films that fit, that fit the bill for the whole arrow um, uh, catalog uh, that we can find the elements for and that haven't already been released in too many forms elsewhere. Very cool. Well, we're excited for the future of that uh, of what's coming up next. I still I encourage everyone to. To grab this set, um, it's one of those. It's going to be out of print soon. It's going to be out of print soon, so I want to, we, we've been, been trying to, 
you know, chase that down or get an episode out before it's out of print because it's something that um, I believe it should be in er- every everyone's uh, collection for sure. I, I, I think I think it's important as well. I mean, just for you know, um, to kind of see these underseen and not very well known uh, horror films. Only a few a few people that really have the knowledge and really respect and want to give the time to films like this. Because, I mean, these aren't big money makers. They're not going to, you know, sell like a nor- like to, like St- Stephen said earlier, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Exorcist. Um, you know, it, it's a different type of horror and a horror that needs to be recognized a little bit more um, because we're too focused on kind of the slashers or, you know, um, you know the, the very well known ones. These resurgence of even even films that are hitting Blu-ray that everybody knows. The, yeah, these I, films you see the time of day too. There's there's an unfortunate effect that happens in 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 all in all areas of culture actually, where um, the 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 interesting fringes get uh, get cast aside, and and uh, in the same way that radio stations tend to play. The same, if the same popular records by certain artists, and they don't play the slightly less popular records that are also interesting. You know? uh, so, this is this is a this box set idea is a, is a way of trying to uh, put a flag in the ground for some of the more unusual, less frequently appreciated movies that have still got very strong qualities. Uh, so you're saying Arrow is kind of like the deep tracks of the movie industry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Stephen, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, we're definitely when when the next set comes out, we'd love to talk to you about those films. So the invitations uh, already thrown out there to you to come back if if you'd like to. Sure. Um, and uh, we you know we look forward to uh, everything else. Is there anything else you're doing other than these these arrow sets? Any, any more writing or anything like that that you're doing? Nightmare USA Volume Two. Nice okay. is in the wings. Yeah, fantastic, <laughs> awesome. We'll look forward to that as well. Right. Thanks again. For, is for is the first book still out of print? Uh, no, I think the first book is is back in print now. Back uh, in Fab, print. Okay. Press have got it available again. Yeah. Fantastic. I'll, have right. to, I'll we'll have to pro- grab that. promote that too, um, yeah. because that's. I mean, that's that's kind of uh, one of my because it was one of those times where I thought I knew everything when I would buy all <laughs> these VHS tapes, and then I come across the book, and I was like, shit, I'm not as smart as I thought I was, and you know, it, and but it, what turned me on to the Nightmare USA was you featured two of my favorite films in there, which is The Severed Arm and um, House of the Dead, which is also known as Alien Zone, I believe, which is a really ridiculous title. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to delve into that one more, actually. So, so but yeah, it was it, it turned me on to um, a few things. Actually, you know, Carnival of Blood, which we just discussed, it was one of those films that I really wanted to see um, yeah. for a long time. So I'm glad that Arrow did this because this is uh, substantial for yeah. for some, for their line. I mean, they're always rescuing films and putting out some... I mean, they're killing it with their lineup, but this is uh, there's this one film that was pretty important, I would say, um, to get out there. Brilliant. No, I, well, I'm, I'm glad I, I, I had a... You know, it was a long process writing that book, but I had a great time doing it, and I'm really thrilled that people appreciated it so much. So. Blood of life throws it. We hope you guys dug that interview or conversation with Stephen Thrower. Uh, grab his Are book. They, yeah, there's not really ever interviews. I always say interviews, like even scheduling. Yeah. And I think that throws everybody off, but it's kind of hard. Hey, do you want to have a discussion? Yeah, yeah, We, we try you to know, like, like, yeah. it's it's No, I'm just saying it's weird contacting people because it's not really an interview, but the discussion sounds like, hey, you want to hang out? <laughs> yeah, you know, so. want to talk about your movie? Um, <laughs> you like movies, I like movies too. <laughs> let's just talk about movies, huh? All right, that, grab his book, Nightmare USA. It is out. Uh, it is. It was reprinted, and I'm excited for his next uh, his follow up. Yeah, man, Nightmare great. USA is great. And dude, I'm excited. And the the future of American Horror Project, man, that box set is amazing. You guys should get it before it sells out. I know that when I got mine, I got it through Amazon UK, and it was like twenty bucks cheaper. So keep that in mind when you're ordering. Um, just you know, just be a little bit patient. Wait a couple weeks for it to arrive, maybe three. You'll be fine. They always get to me. I've, I don't think I've ever had an, an 
a UK order lost in the mail. I have had things from Florida lost in the mail. I've I sent know. you two things and they've been <laughs> lost, right? Yep, and Grindhouse Video sent me something and it has never been seen. When did that happen? Uh, with Bride of, Bride of Reanimator. That Fucking sucks. pissed. Somebody knew what was in it and basically stole it. So. Oh, dude, I got a screener the other day. It said right on the fucking box what it was. I know. I've, I've, like, on the package, and I was like, wait a second. Like, what if my mailman is a horror fanatic? I know. <laughs> I, I know. Basically, what we learned is, uh, I think the two, the, the, the one thing he sent me, it, it was, he sent Bride of Reanimator media mail, cause I was, I suggested it trying to save a few bucks, so ultimately it's my fault. So I think media mail for sure, uh, coming my, out my way, especially from Florida, something's fucked up with that. So priority two day all the way. Those never, never, never fail. All right. Enough about my mailing woes. Uh, I want to thank you guys for listening to the show. Next week we should re, re, uh, I can't even talk. We should be returning with BJ Colangelo and Josh Obershaw. But we really wanted to get this episode just out to you guys. So, um, Look forward to that. Of course, check out all of our sponsors. Go to thescreamcast.com slash sponsors and check all of them out. Vinegar Syndrome, Grindhouse Video, Coffee Shop of Horrors, Horror, Horror Pack. Pack, Kevin Spencer, Kevin Spencer, Wolfman of Mars. Wolfman of Mars. Check all them out. Of course, if you buy anything from any of them, take a screenshot of your transaction, email it to us at readme at thescreamcast.com. We'll enter you into the next drawing for coffee and a mug and some other goodies. We're going to be doing a drawing for Sean's big box of porn. Uh, oh, yeah. Speaking of which, it's screencast-twister oh, for your uh, 10% off. Vinegar Syndrome. Your Vinegar Syndrome May pack. Screamcast-twister. But we are going to be doing a Sean's box of porn drawing probably next month. So we need to think of something uh, fun for that. We want uh, you when you when you enter. We want to know what you're entering for. <laughs> we don't want a surprise box of porn showing up on your doorstep if that's not what you're into. Yes. But uh, stay tuned. You know, keep your eyes peeled for that. We'll be tweeting out stuff like that. And uh, as far as that goes, info. And uh, we'll talk to all of you guys next week. Is this debuting tomorrow? Bye-bye. Wait, is this debu- debuting tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. All right, then we need to pimp out Vinegar Syndrome's uh, free international shipping. Oh, when tomorrow. are they doing that? Uh, tomorrow. only One day only. One day only. Today, as you're listening to this, order from Vinegar Syndrome today. Yeah, free international shipping sale from... 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. Damn. All right. So your international people that listen to us, I know that we have quite a few listeners in the U.K., I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, Here's your chance. Uh, Pick up Telephone Book, American Dreamer, Dolomite. Same thing with our friends in Canada. Take advantage of that. Oh, yeah, Canada, too. Shipping to them is bullshit. Yeah, because they lose money every time. Ugh. It's like 77, like the Canadian dollar is 77 cents over here now. Yeah. Like that, we feel that, for you that, guys. That hurts, man. We really do. All right. And with that, you guys have a great week. Talk to you next time. Or great weekend. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, don't tell me you're leaving. The party's just begun.